Thank you for the uh, very nice introduction and the opportunity to give a, a presentation here at this uh, conference. And I immediately have to disappoint you because I'm not here so much representing Philips as well the health.e lighthouse. And uh, let me start straight away by explaining you in a few words what this lighthouse uh, is all about. So the lighthouse is an, uh, is an initiative initiated by the uh, Excel joint undertaking a few years ago. Now KD, more better known as KDT, and it is, I always explain it as a kind of initiative to, uh, to streamline certain research activities and projects in, in Europe, certain topics. And we have at the moment three lighthouses, one on Industry 4.0, we have on mobility and we have on, uh, on health. And I'm going to tell something about health. And the, the idea is that we develop a mission and a vision and that we also contribute to the strategic uh, roadmaps that are out there. So let me start with uh, showing you uh, that healthcare is changing, and I think you are all aware of that. And the most important trends going on is, is that healthcare is becoming more and more decentralized. It's moving from the, the hospital environment to the home environment, and it's becoming more and more personalized, going from blockbuster therapies to really personalized therapies. And the question is, what is the, the effect of that for the electronic components and system, system industry and what, what, what are the opportunities there and what, what are the learnings? What I always tell is, is that uh, what these changes in healthcare are causing is a fading of the borders between the traditional silos of the electronic components and systems industry, pharma and medtech. And on these fading borders we see the development of a number of um, what I would call emerging medical domains that not only hold great promise for patients but also for industry. And since I'm here on this conference, I have tried to uh, select a few examples that, one way or the other, involve like printed electronics or, uh, or smart textiles. And the first one I would like to show is about personal ultrasound. So we all know ultrasound from, from scanning a uh, pregnant woman for a baby. And you see that happening here. And what you also see in this picture, and that's very important, you see a professional, professional sonographer taking this image. And so at Philips we have uh, plenty of those ultrasound equipment standing uh, around, and I often try to make an image of, my, of myself to try if you can see something inside. And then you discover how terribly complicated it is to make a meaningful image. You meet, need somebody who is, has knowledge about uh, anatomy and about physiology, and also about how you use ultrasound equipment to produce a meaningful image. What is coming up is the development of uh, MEMS ultrasound transducers. So these transducers can be made in, in large volumes at relatively low cost, and they enable the integration of what we call 2D ultrasound arrays. And these ultrasound arrays are able to make these kind of stunning images. And beautiful as these images are, for parents, eh? but they hold actually very little clinical relevance. But what they do enable is they scan not only a plane in the body, but they scan a 3D volume. And if you combine a 3D volume with artificial intelligence algorithms, software can actually, from that volume, extract the relevant clinical information. And that is enabling yeah, something completely new Ultrasound for laymen, uh, we always call it. It will move ultrasound from the hospital setting to first-line caretakers, but in the end, as you see here in these pictures, also even to consumer settings. So, what we see happening is that next to card-based, uh, the traditional card-based ultrasound and ultrasound for minimal invasive uh, tools, we see a completely new market, market emerging for, for portable and personal ultrasound, but even for wearable ultrasound. And that is adding a completely new dimension to health patches. And so far, health patches only could sense things at the surface of the skin, but not inside the body. And with these tiny, uh, small ultrasound transducers, it also becomes possible to have a look inside the body. And what we developed the, over the past years in a Penta project called Olympia, we developed this first crude prototype of a wearable ultrasound patch. It's meant to be a modular platform. Uh, for a number of universal applications, and in this case we are concentrating on bladder monitoring, the device is still too large, it still looks clumsy, but the next generation we, have, we are now defining a new Excel, uh, Excel KDT 
project where we will take this concept and move it towards a really high TRL level. And the applications are many. Data monitoring is obviously, lung monitoring is something very important and we will immediately recognize this in this COVID times, cardiac output, bone movement, etc. Another uh, application, another emerging domain is uh, wound care. So many, sorry to present this to you on this uh, early morning, <laughs> many people with diabetes suffer from chronic wounds because they have a bad uh, circulation. And actually, every minute in this world, a foot is somewhere amputated because people suffer from chronic wounds. The only way to treat that at the moment, and the most common way, is that uh, you have a bandage, wound dressing, and every day a nurse passes by to see what the condition is of this dressing. It's painful because the dressing has to be removed. It's also labor intensive and very expensive. So that is where there are many projects going on where people are trying to develop smart wound dressings that have sensors and that can sense the condition of the wound and only uh, signal when this dressing needs to be replaced. One of these new emerging domains. There are a number of projects going on, especially in Ireland, on this, uh, on this topic. As a third example, I would show, would like to show organ on chip, which is a very hot topic in, in Europe at the moment. And what you see here on the lower left corner is Alexander Fleming in his laboratory, and you see all kinds of test tubes and, and uh, battery dishes with broths in it. And when you look at pharma these days, you see that the situation, well, they have gone to more multiplexing and, and parallelism, but the situation is pretty much the same. What is coming up is a completely new generation of uh, disease uh, disease and, and uh, disease models that are based on microfluidic devices that represent and that simulate the conditions as they really occur in the body. Cells don't grow well in a, in a hard environment, in a well place or in a battery dish. Cells need the environment in terms of flow, pulsating flow, stretching, movement, all the physical factors that you have in the real body to express the correct phenotype. And modern microfluidics can do that. And uh, that is coinciding with the development of new technologies to derive cells with, uh, from samples with the human genome. It has all kinds of touchings with, uh, with printed electronics. And the Morph Medical uh, Excel project, one of the things that we are developing there is a smart well plate where all these organ chip devices can be combined into something that can be handled by, by pharma. And Biotech. And there are many aspects there where printed electronics uh, can turn up to, to print over irregular form factors, make stretchable structures, and, and also include uh, microfluidics. So you see that there are many, many of those emerging medical domains, but when you really have a look at what is hitting the market, the devices that are coming out there, then it's disappointingly little. What we did in the Health of the Lighthouse, we first made an inventory of, of these emerging medical domains as far as they are relevant for the electronic components and system industry. We collected those emerging medical domains in, in a white paper. You can download it from the, from the website. I also have it on paper these days. And if you, if you send me your address, I will be happy to send you those, uh, those white papers. Old men, so I still prefer reading it from paper. And then we look at what is now really hampering innovation there. And of course, many people immediately say it's uh, medical device regulations. And of course, that is really a, a horror, especially for small companies. But we think that one of the most important factors is the lack of open technology platforms in the medical domain. And the next few, few slides, I try to explain that. And what I've done in this slide, I've tried to sketch the value chain in the normal electronic consumer domain, going all the way from the, the, the consumer through the device, to the system, to the data and standard level. And you see that on all levels, the industry has adopted open technology platforms. So on each level, you have, by, by moving towards open technology platforms, you generate the production volumes that you really need in order to do sustainable innovation. I will give you an example. When I started at Philips Semiconductors in 1988, we did everything ourselves. We made our own silicon wafers, we made our own photo masks, we had our processes, and we uh, the circuit design, everything. And the first thing that we stopped doing with was uh, making our own silicon wafers, because the industry realized that if you have one company 
making those wafers, a few companies making those wafers, they can make the wafers at a lower price, a higher quality and a larger size. And that idea of open technology platform has pervaded the whole electronic industry. And these days you can start your own semiconductor company if you have a powerful workstation and you are of course a clever designer. You can start your own semiconductor company. And that situation is different in the medical domain. And again here, a value chain going from the body to the device system data. And then you see that on the system and data level we can borrow from the normal electronic industry. But where it often goes wrong is at the device level. That is the level where the electronics is interfacing with the living matter, be it the body or be it cells. There you very often still see many, many, many point solutions. Point solutions that are very expensive to develop and in the end they never reach the market. Uh, we have a fab in Eindhoven where we also produce a lot of micro devices from external customers and we had a look at the request that we had and we had about 15 requests from small companies of an SMEs for a cell sorting device. So these companies, they go to a university, the university develops a device, they go to, to Philips and they say, can you produce it? And then we say, yeah, we can produce it, but it will cost you two or three million to develop that from a university concept to something that is manufacturable. And then they are out again. And they are not interested in making that device for cell sorting, they are interested in cell sorting. They want to have their cells sorted and they want to cure something, Alzheimer's or cancer. If they would all use one or the same platform and not so much concentrate on that pure technology level, I think they would be better off. So that is the simple message that we want to convey in the, in the lighthouse. We want to introduce more for medical and we want to do that by motivating the ECS industry to, and also the medical industry to work more towards open technology platform on that basic technology level. Value is shifting, not that's, that's already happened in the, in the electronic industry, where value has shifted from the technology level towards the application and solution level. And that is also going to happen in the, in the medical domain. I always tell, 20 years ago, a medical device was an uh, X-ray machine and it produced a picture. That was it. And these days, the medical device is an X-ray machine. It produces a file. The file goes into an algorithm, and it goes into AI, and then it goes into the cloud, and then it goes into workflow integration, and whatever you have. And there is much more value in that higher part than in that lower part. But that lower part, that lower technology part, is still very important. And there you can only get really innovation if you share forces there. That's the simple message we want to convey. Now, this, these are the advantages of open technology platforms. You can read it for yourself. I think I've already explained it. And what we do in this Health.E e Lighthouse is we want to create awareness in the ECS community of the opportunities that are out there in the, in the health domain. I've just shown you a few examples. We want to promote open technology platforms to the, uh, to the medical industry. And we want to say, hey, this, this model works very well for the ECS domain. See if there are elements in there that you can copy and we want to create a sustainable ecosystem of projects and companies that are working towards open technology platforms. Of course, open technology platforms for a medical device are something different than open technology platforms in the semiconductor industry. We, we very much realized that and what we did in an, in an extensive workshop, we made an inventory of all the differences and challenges that you might have with open technology platforms for, for medical devices. And all these considerations, but also recommendations are uh, summarized in, in the second white paper that we produced. Many people will say it's impossible in, in the medical domain to work, to, work, uh, to work towards open technology platforms. Now, I want to show you an example of what we did in, in smart catheters. So, 20 years ago, if you had a problem with your heart, it almost exclusively meant open chest or even open heart surgery. These days, many, many of these interventions can be done using minimally invasive procedures and these procedures are very often assisted with smart catheters. Catheters that can, with ultrasound, image something within your heart or even within your coronary arteries. Beautiful as these instruments are, what is on the market today are literally 20 year old, is literally 20 year old technology. It's, if you look at the, the devices, beautiful as they are, it's shameful what all the technology is in there. And that is exactly because of the reasons I explained to you. Pe companies come, came with a product, 
they put a lot of effort in, in keeping this product alive, keeping the technology alive, and don't have the resources to, to develop the next generation of projects, because, just because the, the volume is too small. What we developed in the, uh, what we did in the position project, it's also an Excel joint undertaking project, is we developed, even together with competitors, we developed a technology platform that can be used for multiple applications by multiple users. And at the same time, we made there a transition to go from analog sensors to digital sensors. We went to modern MEMS technology, and there, this technology, these technologies are really open technology platforms. It also relates to printed electronics, back to printed electronics. Um, what you see here is an instrument that is used to remo remove a pacemaker lead. So if you have a pacemaker, you have a lead going in your, in your arteries from the pacemaker to in, inside your heart. When the pacemaker needs replacement, or the lead breaks, you need a new late lead, and then that old lead has to be removed. But very often it connects, it grows into the wall of your arteries. And then we have these instruments there. They are made actually by Philips. And they sh you shift them over the lead, and it drills out the lead from your, from your arteries. And of course you have to do that very carefully because otherwise you drill through the artery wall or even through the heart wall. And what we are developing is a smart lead extraction device which has ultrasound on the tip. And for that tip we use modern silicon, MEMS technology of course, but the tip itself, and you see it here on the right, it's a tiny device. We want to use 4D printing, so a combination of mechanical printing and electrical printing to realize that a small device where we can connect those chips to the leads going to the external world. So it's an example not of large area printing technology, but of small area printing technology. We are really pushing there towards smaller form factors. And we do that together with Signify. They make lighting, uh, lighting fixtures with the same technology. And they have actually the same problem as we have. Because we move electronics into a tiny, smaller, smaller, smaller volume. You always need mechanical support and you need electrical conductivity. And here we try to combine the two in one technology. This project started uh, last year. It's, uh, it's running very well. And this year we will start a new project called Hyperstripes, also a Penta project. And there we are going to look at the use of printed and also copper folded foil technology to replace the individual wires that now run from the distal tip of the instrument to the proximal side by a printed structure. It has its own challenges. Now, finally, I would like to point you to uh, take it a step further in open technology platforms. We have, we have a large Excel joint undertaking project running already for two years. It's called Morpho Medical. It addresses six emerging medical domains. And for each of these domains, we are developing an open technology platform with a, a large group of uh, enthusiastic uh, partners. Now, with that, I want to conclude. I uh, just want to point you to the, to the, the website of the Health of the Lighthouse where you can find the documents that I mentioned for download. And we also have a link to the page where you can follow us. And I would like to conclude with the message that uh, open technology platforms for medical devices is something new and we have to learn it. But I think it's the only way to really go to affordable and mass producible healthcare devices that we will need for, for the future of healthcare. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for this very interesting talk and also the idea of how to do innovation by even changing the way we're doing this. And I think that that's uh, an important issue we need to talk. How is there a question from the audience? We can discuss right now. We still have some time for questions. If it's not the case, you can think. Uh, maybe I ask one question up front. Is, uh, of course, these, these open platforms, um, sometimes big companies have uh, some hesitations in going to, because it's really changing business models. Um, you've really mentioned that this is Health E. Uh, how does a big company like Philips think about these open platforms? Well, we are actually pushing it. Okay. Because company at VS Philips, we are concentrating more and more to the, on the higher end of the value chain. And we realize that, and you cannot, so we have a limited R&D budget, and you cannot spend it on everything. So most of the money these days for research goes into the, this higher end of the value chain. And we also realize, so we develop these, these technologies for smart catheters and Siemens 
and, and the MEMS ultrasound, and we very much realized that if we do that alone, even for us, it's impossible to, uh, to maintain it. What you see, it's more the contrary. It's more the small companies that are really afraid for IP issues, that they lose their IP position or their, their uh, let's say, the competitive edge. They are more afraid of adopting other technology platforms, I think, than the larger companies. Interesting. Is, is that something you would share? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not, not, yet. Yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Now, but I think, of course, also, again, also for printed electronics, uh, where we are really also sometimes young, of course, people try to secure an IP position and start from there. So I think that that has to be thought through, of course, and also discussed for the implications. Any other discussion? Ah, here's one, please. First of all, thank you very much for this awesome uh, presentation. Uh, my question is coming back to your um, statement on these uh, smart wound patches. As you said, uh, these technologies, smart wound patches, so, you know, the, the wound care. Ah, wound care, yeah. yeah. Um, so these technologies are quite, let's say, old uh, in our uh, speaking. Yes, I think these. Uh, uh, innovation is five, six years old, and still, even though it will bring really huge savings in uh, communities and hospitals, this technology is not taking off. Um, would you really see the obstacle that this is not an open source based solution, or is the lobby of the, let's call it, dump wound care so strong that they protect their markets? Well, I have two, two answers to your question. Um, first of all, um, first of all, there is still technology missing. Uh, so, for wound dressings, uh, if you take a dressing of a wound, you cannot just throw it into the dustbin. Uh, it's uh, it's biological waste, and very often it will need to go into an incinerator, and that has consequences for the electronics that is inside. So people are thinking of constructions where you remove the electronics. The things, for, for instance, something like an incinerable battery is a component that is still lacking in, in, for that. So, and that can also be a technology platform. So, that is, so there is still technology missing, I would say, that is one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, of course, that uh, the industry is very conservative. And you see it also in organ chip. It's also an example where it is very clear that these new disease and organ models can, great, can create great benefits. But the adoption of it by pharma, by CROs, is very slow. And that is, a, for a part, just a matter also of, of continuing to, to push and to, to show them and to show also the advantages in, in clinical, uh, clinical use. But the, the, the medical world is very conservative. And variable flows are established, and it is very difficult to, from a, from a technology push point of view, to change those variable flows. And so, what we it, at Philips these days try to do, we have also new technologies for guiding catheters and so on. We, we try to not push them as Philips as a new technology, but we try to create this the, 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 the sphere where. Key opinion leaders are starting to ask for it and pull for it. So it also requires a new, I would say, marketing perspective of those technologies. Don't try to push it as technology, don't try to bring it as technology push, but try to engage key opinion leaders that they really are screaming for these technologies. So it's a long and complicated answer because of a question that I also don't be asked to exactly, but these are components of the answer. Thank you. I think that that's a very important thing because adoption of, especially in the medical area, uh, avoids a lot of other people, from doctors, but even also from nurses. You you mentioned it, and that's a different community, and I, I, actually this uh, takes quite longer than uh, typical. So yes, this is one of the challenges. Further questions? That's not the case. Let's thank one again. Great. Okay. Great. 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 Great.